we have a Bible college here, and we're going to have the life of David starting, I believe, uh, in a week, Monday nights at 6.30 p.m. On Tuesday night, we have 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John talked by Gary Smith. And then on Thursday night, we have the book of Daniel taught by Charlie Johnson from Mesa Calvary Chapel. Or at Patchy Junction, I'm sorry. So um, if you want to sign up for this, you can. If you want to get credit, college credit, you have to pay for the college hours. If you want to audit it, it's much less. And if you just want to take it for nothing, we can do that too. But you make your choices on that. It's three good courses this year and in the spring session. Uh, we're also going to Israel. And we have 39 people going right now. Nine people are going to meet us here. 30 of us are going over from here to Switzerland to visit with Brad Antolovich for two days. And then we're going on into uh, Israel. And nine people are coming from here and one from Australia, two from Canada. So there'll be six from here. And we're all go they're going to meet us in Jerusalem, or actually in Tel Aviv, on the 28th. So if you want to join, we have room for a couple more on the bus. If you want to join us on that bus, you can get there still. And not, you won't be able to go to Switzerland, but you'll be able to meet us there. We'll arrange everything for you and uh, go to two weeks. It'll be from the 28th. You'll leave. Uh, you'll meet us there at the 28th. You'll leave the 27th, and we'll be there until the 9th of March, a great, great time. And I wish everybody could go to Switzerland. It's going to be really good. Uh, we're going to have our brother come up. And uh, he's going to, Ray is going to continue sharing his message with us. And I remember Eve was deceived. And uh, deception is a big thing. And, he's, and it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, I fear lest as Satan beguiled Eve, your hearts should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Jesus Christ. And that's Jim's lesson after this lesson. So remember that simplicity. God bless you. Ray. <clears throat> Good afternoon, folks. How you doing? Uh, how many of you were here last night? Oh, practically all of you. Well, anyhow, I was told afterwards that there was, uh, while I was speaking, there was a Reiki master sitting over in this section here. You know, this is the third level, you know, the, the ones that can initiate people into it, not just do it, but initiate people into it. And I was told that she got up and left when I was talking about Reiki. So obviously she was offended. But, you know, that's okay. Uh, this information I had about the Reiki guides came from Reiki sources. It wasn't like I made it up or got it from Christian sources that thought it might, there might be guides. This is actually from Christian sources. So, I mean, New Age sources. So, um, you know, you cannot, you cannot combine the kingdom of God with spirit guides. You know, it just can't be done. And I was told this woman somehow felt that she was a Christian. She read the Bible and thought you could combine Reiki with, you know, Christianity. But, you know, you just can't do it. It's impossible. Anyhow, tonight, or this afternoon, we're going to look at uh, some very controversial uh, issues and subjects. The um, uh, Christian mysticism. Could we have the Christian mysticism and the emerging church? How many of you have heard of these terms, at least the emerging church? Very controversial. We're going to be examining, you know, what, how this would conflict with traditional biblical Christianity and how it might fit into end time scenarios. So um, uh, let's let's begin next. Uh, it's kind of small. <laughs> yeah, it was designed mainly for a larger screen, but, uh, but you can all see it, can't you? You can all see it. This is a contemplative circle um, at the Shalane Prayer Institute in Washington D.C. And uh, let me see, um, could someone bring me that uh, uh, pointer that, with the red dot? That was very, I should have, should have made, I thought it was up here, but apparently not. Anyhow, uh, well, you can see, I don't, I don't have to. Anyhow, the, I was going to point out the guy on the extreme right there. His name is Tilden Edwards, the guy that's in the kind of the gray suit or gray jacket. And he is the founder of the Shalame Institute for Spiritual Formation, and this is an organization designed to train spiritual directors, and it's been around for something like 30-some years, I think it was founded in the early 70s, and you can see there's quite a variety, see the candle in the middle? 
right in the middle there's a candle, and they're all sitting around engaging what's called contemplative prayer. You know, you got a, uh, a wide variety of, uh, you know, ages there. Well, contemplative prayer is at the heart of the emerging church and a number of other movements that are now starting to uh, appear within evangelical Christianity. Um, the term contemplative, oh, I, he's bringing it now, good. <coughs> it, it does help, you know. Thanks. I, yeah, I've learned my lesson, I don't have it up there anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's Tilden Edwards right there. He founded uh, the Shalem Institute, and I was going to read what he says. This is from my book, A Time of Departing. And it kind of sums up the attitude of many people in the mainline denominations and the Roman Catholic Church. He's an Episcopal priest himself. And this kind of sums up uh, the way he views things. He says, In the wider ecumenism of the Spirit being open for us today, we need to humbly accept the learnings of particular Eastern religions. What makes a particular practice Christian is not its source, but its intent. Okay. This is important to remember in the face of those Christians who would try to impoverish our spiritual resources by too narrowly defining them. Who would that be? If we view the human family as one in God's spirit, then this historical cross-fertilization is not surprising. Selective attention to Eastern spiritual practices can be of a great assistance to a fully embodied Christian life. Tilden Edwards. So what they're doing here, remember last night we, uh, we saw pictures of this woman meditating. and For 10 years I was <sighs> fooled by the term contemplative prayer. See, I knew what centering prayer was, but I thought that contemplative prayer was, you know, when you would pray, and then you would think a little bit, and then you would pray a little more, and then you would think a little bit more, you know, and I thought, well, you know, everybody does that. That can't be bad. But then I found out that contemplative prayer and centering prayer were the same thing, that in contemplative prayer, you switch off your mind and your soul contemplates God in a mystical trance state. So it has nothing to do with really contemplating, it has something to do with not thinking. In other words, the soul contemplates God while the mind is shut off. Next, please. And this is from a book called The Inward Journey. And it says, to help the mind become quiet, we can follow our breathing, or we can repeat silently a chosen prayer phrase or a word. And this is the essence of contemplative prayer. Is, and we're going to see this in a bit, that uh, there's... They say there's no way you can really know God just by thinking. You know, in your five senses, your, your mind is always getting in the way. So if you create this space, then God will fill it. So you create this void by repeating these words over and over again. And they call it the silence. And then God can, you know, it's like God's waiting up there saying, I wish I could communicate with, you know, so-and-so, but they're just thinking all the time. <laughs> I know it sounds funny, but next one, please. Okay, this is a book called When the Soul Listens, put out by Nav Press. See, Nav Press, which traditionally has been an you know, evangelical publishing company. And we're starting to see this more and more in evangelical circles. This is put out by a woman named Jan Johnson. She goes around leading seminars and, and uh, workshops on this. Uh, she was at Willow Creek here. I'm not Willow Creek, uh, Saddleback recently. And... Um, Next one, please. And this is what she says. And, th and th I picked this because all books on contemplative prayer could be summed up in this, in this uh, quote right here. This is very typical. This isn't something out of the ordinary. This is, you know, very common. Contemplative prayer, in its simplest form, is prayer in which you still your thoughts. This puts you in a better state to be aware of God's presence. And it makes you better able to hear God's voice correcting guiding and directing you. And by still your thoughts, she doesn't mean being like in a still room where you can have thoughts. She means to still your thoughts. In other words, get rid of them. 
And of course, this is done by what we saw earlier by repeating. And she has mantras in this book, you know, like it can be anything of a religious nature. You just say it over and over again. And then, you know, but the essence here is that um, makes you better able and uh, better state. In other words, the common theme over and over again is you have to do this in order to really hear God. That, you know, God isn't going to really guide or direct you if you don't do this kind of prayer. This is the way to get God. Now, how many of you are parents? Oh, quite a few of you. Now, do your children need a method to get your attention? You know, I mean, if you're a good parent, you, you naturally guide and direct them, right? It's not like you're just waiting for them to engage in some kind of method so you can guide and direct them. You just do it naturally, right? Well, you see, this is what Christianity is. This is, right off the bat, it should be apparent to everyone that there's something wrong here, you know, that if you're in Christ, if you're in the body of Christ, you know, and Christ dwells within you, there's going to be this natural relationship. But instead, you know, you have to have this kind of mystical prayer in order to hear God. Okay, next one. Okay, this comes from a group called the Desert Fathers. You don't see anything about using um, repetitive words or focusing on your breath in the Old or New Testament. Um, the Desert Fathers were these monks that lived in the mid- deserts of the Middle East, Egypt, you know, pa- um, Syria, places like that, but mainly Egypt, North Africa. And they experimented with different ways to pray. They experimented, you know, and they tried this and they tried that. And one of the things they came up with, next one, is mantra meditation. This is actually from a book written by a Catholic priest called The Dawn of the Mystical Age. This Frank, uh, uh, Frank Tutti is a Catholic priest, and he talks about the Desert Fathers. And he says, the 4th century Desert Fathers understood that a simple device was needed to keep the monkey mind from wandering. And that term monkey mind is, you know, you're always, the mind is always active, you know, like monkeys are always chattering and swinging around, anyhow, they call that the monkey mind. Thus, so you got the monkey mind, you're always thinking about something. Thus, the mantra method of prayer, which had been introduced centuries before by Buddhists and Hindus, came to be a stable form of Christian prayer, not only for the desert fathers and mothers, but for Christians down through the ages. So the desert fathers developed this kind of uh, mantra-type prayer, and then various pilgrims would come from Europe. I think there was a guy named John Cassane who uh, brought it to England, and, and it worked its way through the monastic systems you know, throughout the Middle Ages, and it became, uh, there, there were various saints who did this. You know, your common people didn't do this. Peasants didn't do this. There were various saints like Meister Eckhart. Anybody ever heard of him? Or St. John of the Cross. Or St. Teresa of Avila. How many of you heard of St. Teresa of Avila? Well, she actually levitated. You know, she would meditate and she'd actually fly up in the air. You know, I know that sounds funny, but, you know, that's what they said she did. And so uh, it went from the... Desert, it went from the Buddhists and the Hindus to the Desert Fathers, and they passed it on into the uh, European monastic systems, which, you know, down through the ages. Or next one. Okay, this is called Spiritual Directors International. This is um, uh, an organization made up of people who have embraced this type of prayer, and they call themselves spiritual directors, and their job is to train people to do this kind of prayer. You know, you find them in various churches and retreat centers and things like that. And this is their logo. There's this woman here, you know, it looks like some kind of Pepsi commercial, (laughs) you know, or Coke commercial. And here's this ball of light right here, this this radiant light there. And there's this woman like, oh, yes, yes, give it to me, give it to me. You know, I'm here. I want God. I want God. And, uh, but when you see what uh, Spiritual Directors International, what, what they're Their spirituality is, it gives reason for concern. Next one. Okay, this is their mission statement. Throughout human history, individuals have been called to accompany others seeking the mystery we name God. In this time, Spiritual Directors International responds to this call by tending the holy around the world and across traditions. Now, what does that mean, across traditions? Does that mean like Lutheran and Methodist or um, Pentecostal or... And Baptist, is that what it means? No, next one. Okay, this is their, uh, taken from their courses and classes. 
Okay, first one is spiritual practice across faith traditions. And the next one kind of says, you know, indicates what that means. Building a bridge to Buddhism. So Spiritual Directors International isn't just about between Christians. It's building a bridge to Buddhism. Okay, there's Ignatian exercises in an ecology. Um, the Enneagram and Kabbalah. There we have Jewish mysticism, which we talked about last night. The Sacred Labyrinth, a new spiritual paradigm. A labyrinth is a maze which you walk through and do a mystical type prayer in. Earth prayer, celebrating the interconnection of all living beings. You know, that's classic New Ageism right there. That's what we've been talking about this whole conference is the interconnection between everything that is. And then the last one is trans-faith spirituality. In other words, this type of prayer, if you do contemplative prayer, this will allow you to reach across all different faiths and all different religions and like it says, building a bridge to Buddhism. Well, not just Buddhism, but Hinduism and Islam and virtually every mystical system that exists. And we'll see that uh, later on in this talk. Next one. Okay, this is uh, their uh, membership, how many people they have. And notice that relatively few in Europe, but you know, North America, uh, look at these numbers. They add up to something like 5,000 people. Okay, it has uh, uh, Midwest, Northeast, uh, northwest, south, southwest, 853 in the southwest. Now, these, are spirit, these aren't people that are just mem- uh, or, you know, go someplace and hear lectures. These are people who train people. So altogether, there's 5,000 people in the United States that belong to this organization that train people in spiritual, uh, mystical-type prayer. So if each one, if there's 5,000, each one trains 100 a year. That's half a million people a year. And then they go out and start interacting with people and training, you know, telling people about it. So, you know, you could get quite a snowball effect. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this, this is Thomas Merton here. He is to contemplative prayer what Elvis Presley was to rock and roll. See, before, before Elvis Presley, there was rock and roll, but it wasn't really that big. It had a very narrow niche, you know, and he, Elvis Presley made it this huge popular musical um, genre, and also he's contemplative prayer what Henry Ford is to the automobile. Before Henry Ford, there were cars, but Henry Ford made it possible for everyone to have an automobile. I mean, anybody who could afford it, you know, I mean. Um, so anyhow, Thomas Merton took contemplative prayer out of the monastery, back in the 1960s, he died in 1968, but he took contemplative prayer out of the monasteries and convents and spread it all throughout the Catholic Church. You know, he made it possible that, you know, he promoted it to the degree that, you know, millions of people in the Catholic Church started to do it. And then he became popular in the mainline denominations, and now he's becoming popular in the evangelical church. And we'll see that later. Okay, next one. Okay, this is a book uh, called Merton and Sufism. Uh, this guy here is a Sufi sheikh. Okay, Sufism, and there's Thomas Merton right there. Sufism is the mystical element of Islam, you know, the Muslim religion. They live in, they're kind of like the Jedi Knights from Star Wars. They, they, the, Suf is the Arabic word for wool, and they, they're very ascetic. They live in these brotherhoods, and uh, they engage in mystical prayer by chanting the name of Allah over and over again. How many of you have heard of the whirling dervishes? Okay, you've heard of them? They're, this, uh, they're these Sufis that live in Turkey, and they, uh, they have big, long gowns, and they have big, tall hats, and they, they chant, and they start whirling, and their skirts fly up, and, and they're just whirling around. Their skirts go up like a, like a top, you know, and, and they're chanting, Allah, Allah, you know. And, um, you know, the Sufis are quite extensive, and this uh, individual here was a Sufi master. You know, he was very, uh, very popular. Now, keep in mind, the Sufis have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They totally repudiate it. They're, more, they're, more, they're kind of like the New Agers of Islam. They're much more like the Hindus than they are actual Muslims, but they were uh, very widespread in, in Islam. I'm going to read to you what Thomas Merton said about that individual there. This is the book right here. If you'll kindly look at the guy's face there. His name was Sheikh Ahmad El Alawi. And he lived in Algeria. Died in 1934. 
Thomas Merton called him one of the greatest religious figures of this century. He was, this is, these are all quotes from Merton, who's on the right there. He was so perfectly right in his spirituality, certainly a great saint and a man full of the Holy Spirit. May God be praised for having, giving, having given us one, one such in this time when we need many saints. With Sheikh Ahmed, I speak the same language. So what we see here is Thomas Merton was not interested in giving the gospel to Sufis. He spoke the same language. He was on their wavelength. And Thomas Merton is now considered, like I said, the kind of the, the main icon of the contemplative prayer movement. Uh, Richard Foster quotes him 11 times in his book, Celebration of Discipline. Later on, we'll get to a quote that Foster did that actually changed my life. Okay, next one. Okay, this is Henry Nouwen. How many of you have heard of Henry Nouwen? Okay, he, uh, he was a disciple of Merton. He was a Catholic priest, and he picked up on Merton's spirituality, uh, started to write. He's written many books. One of them is called The Way of the Heart, which is a primer on uh, mantra meditation. He says you repeat a sacred word, and you're, you, how do you put it? You... Uh, you descend from the mind into the heart. In other words, your consciousness goes, you shut off your mind, and your inner being goes down to your heart where you find God. And this is, you know, traditional mantra meditation. Uh, Kay Warren, uh, this is one of Kay Warren's favorite authors. He wrote a book called, uh, uh, what's it called? The, uh, oh, I can't remember the time, but I think it's called the, Oh, I, I, my mind just went blank, but anyhow, I'll think of it later. Uh, in the name of Jesus, that's it, in the name of Jesus. And he says that, it's a book on Christian leadership, and he says that for Christian leadership to be effective, we need to move from the moral to the mystical. From the moral to the mystical. And that in the future, for Christian leadership to be effective, uh, they have, whenever they have any problems, he actually said this, whenever they have any problems or challenges, they need to turn to contemplative prayer in order to find the answer. And this is Kay, in this book, Kay Warren actually said this is her favorite book. Henry Nouwen is one of the, uh, probably next to Merton, he is one of the most popular icons of the contemplative prayer movement. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this is, for anybody who doubts, you know, Nowen's New Age proclivities, he wrote the foreword to a book, an actual New Age book. And he says that, um, um, the, he's talking about this Catholic priest, Father Ryan, went to India to learn, you know, the, their spiritual ways. And Henry Nowen wrote the foreword to this book. And Nowen says, the author shows a wonderful openness to the gifts of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Muslim religion. He discovers their great wisdom for the spiritual life of the Christian. Okay, Ryan went to India to learn from the spiritual traditions other than his own. He brought home many treasures and offers, this to, offers them to us in the book. So Henry Nouwen believed that Hinduism, Hinduism and Buddhism offered us many treasures. Well, there's no gospel in Hinduism or Buddhism. It's strictly man is divine. You know, man is God. Okay, next one, please. Richard Foster. Richard Foster. Uh, he wrote a book called Celebration of Discipline. And this book has sold two and a half million copies. This is one of the most influential books in evangelical Christianity. Uh, one pastor told me that there's hardly a pastor in the United States who does not have Celebration of Discipline in their study. And, okay, he was, Foster was a disciple of Thomas Merton, and he personally knew Henry Nouwen. In one of his books, he wrote about being in Henry Nouwen's apartment. So you have to be good buddies with somebody to be in their, their home, right? So he, um, he totally bought what uh, Henry uh, Nouwen and Thomas Merton were into. And, and Richard Foster believes that there's this stream called the contemplative stream that evangelical Christianity is missing, you know, that... Christianity is not complete without this tradition, you know, that goes back to the Desert Fathers. So it's his job. He uh, founded an organization called Renovare to renovate the church, to renovate Christianity. And he does, he, his view is that this will be done 
by incorporating contemplative prayer into evangelical Christianity. Now, I was going to mention something that um, Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Church, now that only sold half a million copies, The Purpose Driven Life sold uh, 35 million copies, but in The Purpose Driven Church, Rick Warren says, and he actually mentions Foster by name, that God has raised up the spiritual formation movement as exemplified by Richard Foster and Dallas Willard to bring the church to full maturity. In other words, the church has, is not mature. You know, it's not mature. Well, why isn't it mature? Well, it's not mature because not enough people do contemplative prayer. And Rick Warren believes that if people catch uh, Foster's vision and start doing contemplative prayer, that will bring the church to full maturity. Well, think about it. I mean, what's missing? Well, the church is mature, right? I mean, there's a lot of mature Christians, right? But they don't do contemplative prayer. So according to... Um, Rick Warren, I mean, this is, this is the key element that will make the church mature, is contemplative prayer. Okay, next one. He says, we should all, without shame, enroll in the school of contemplative prayer. I thought that's from Celebration of Dis I thought it was kind of weird he said without shame, you know, because it is kind of unusual. A lot of people would consider it you know, embarrassing to do the type of prayer where you say the same thing over and over again, right? A lot of people might be ashamed of that, right? You know, to sit down and just repeat something continuously. Well, he says, without shame, we should enroll in the school of contemplative prayer. <sighs> you know, this is, this is a very uh, serious situation. If the contemplative prayer movement succeeds, if it continues to advance, then the Christian of the future will be a mystic. The Christian of the future will be a mystic. And as you've seen, you know, the mysticism that is behind it is not the kind of spirituality that is represented in the New Testament. Uh, next one, please. Okay, this is Ruth Haley Barton. She was um, associate director for spiritual formation at Willow Creek Community Church. Now, well, I'm going to take a drink of water because I still have that, you know, um, lung situation going on. But I want you to look at her, and wouldn't you trust her? Doesn't she look like a nice Christian woman? Yeah, just look at her for a little bit. You know, she, uh, when, you, when you hear the word mystical or metaphysical, you don't think of somebody like her. You think of somebody who looks more counterculturish or more offbeat. But certainly, you know, she looks like... Uh, Somebody who'd uh, be a president's wife, <laughs> right? Amen. Amen. You know? But uh, she broke off from Willow Creek and started something called the Transformation Center, which is um, an organization specifically just to train Christian leaders in contemplative prayer. You know, not just, you know, people off the street, but Christian leaders, you know, ranking Christian leaders in uh, this type of prayer, and she was interviewed in uh, Discipleship Journal in 1999, and it's quite revealing what she says. Next one, please. Uh, a few years ago, I began to recognize an inner chaos in my soul, and this is very common. Many people uh, who get into con contemplative prayer are dissatisfied with Christianity the way it is. This is a common theme, folks. They always talk about how unhappy they are and how they're not fulfilled and how they have no joy and, you know, they're looking for something. And then this is what, excuse me, this is what transpires. This is what unfolds. I sought out a spiritual director. Remember Spiritual Directors International? It could be someone from that organization. Someone well-versed in the ways of the soul. And the spiritual director said to me, what you need is stillness and silence. Stillness and silence. So next one, please. Okay, our reliance on words, even in praying, is often just another way we strive to maintain control. So in other words, doing normal prayer, you're just striving to maintain control. <laughs> well, that's not true. You know, how, what, what, is he, what does she mean by control? You know, talking to God is you know, a very, uh, very constructive and, and intimate thing. I mean, you're not trying to control God. So she says, um, 
We open ourselves to what God wants to give. Prayer without words is not so much about expressing our dependence on God, but rather experiencing it. Okay, next one. Okay, ask for a simple prayer to express your willingness to meet God in the silence. A simple statement such as, here I am. Help yourself return to your original intent by repeating the prayer that you have chosen. So in other words, you continually say, here I am, over and over again for 20 minutes. Like, you know, here I am, 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 here I am. Oh, now, if somebody called you up on the phone and just said, here I am, over and over again, I- I'm serious here. If somebody has called you up and, hello, here I am, here I am, here I am, you know. Is that talking to you? Is that really talking to you? Well, no, it's vain repetition. You know, they're not really talking to you. They're just saying the same thing over and over again. So I believe that this dynamic, you know, that we're looking at here closely mirrors that which we we find in the New Age movement, you know, emptying the mind through repetition, you know, and Jesus warned about that, as we'll see later. Okay, next one. Okay, Brennan Manning, how many of you uh, have heard of him? Okay, he wrote a book. How many of you have heard of a book called The Ragamuffin Gospel? Very popular. Um, Brennan Manning is very, um, this is shocking. Uh, there's two women in the Christian world that um, have um, really latched on to Brennan Manning. One is Amy Grant. And uh, oh, my mind just went blank again. Uh, she's very popular. She was in the Be Still video. Help me, help me. Uh, Beth Moore, yes, Beth Moore. Yeah, Beth Moore uh, did a weekend-long retreat with Brennan Manning. And she says he's one of the most um, influential and most important uh, writers around today. And God has given us, um, you know, a great gift in Brennan Manning. Okay, I've met Brennan Manning. I've met Richard Foster and talked to him. I met Brennan Manning and talked to him. And I found out where they're at. So I know I'm not misrepresenting them or slamming them or, you know, um, uh, align. Um, maligning them in any way. Okay, next one. Okay, this is from a book called uh, The Signature of Jesus. And he says that if you do this, you'll have the signature of Jesus on your life. You know, like a signature, like, you know. If you do this kind of prayer, you'll have his, Jesus' signature. He says, he, he, you know, these people try to be kind of cute and artsy. And he, he talks about grabbing a holt of God, like grabbing a hold of God, you know, like, like that. You know, grabbing a holt of God. Grabbing a holt of God is the goal of contemplative prayer. That is why the first step in faith is to stop thinking about God at the time of prayer. (laughs) Key words here, stop thinking. You know, it may sound funny, but, you know, there's dangerous spiritual consequences behind this. In other words, when, when you pray, when you folks pray, you think about God, right? But he says that the first step is to stop thinking about God. Well, how do you do that? Okay, next one. Again, you choose a single sacred word or phrase without moving your lips. Repeat the sacred word inwardly, slowly, and often. Now, often, that's not like two minutes. That's like 20 minutes. You just say it over and over again. And what that does, the mind can't think. It's like, you know, normally your thoughts are flowing. When you say the same word over and over again, it's like, you know, it can't move. So you go into this boy, this alpha state. And that's what he's talking about. Next one. Okay, William H. Shannon, Silence on Fire. Um, uh, Brendan Manning s- promotes this book. Uh, he said that this is a must-have book in one of the interviews he did. He said this is a very important book to have. And uh, when we look inside, we see that Brendan Manning has, he's in tune with the, William Shannon as a Catholic priest and when we look inside, we see how Brendan Manning is in tune with William Shannon. Because you don't recommend a book like this, The Prayer of Awareness. That's what this is about, The Prayer of Awareness. Okay, next one. And Shannon has the two pillars of contemplative spirituality. God as the ground of all that is and becoming conscious of what is already there. So what he means by God is the ground of all that is is the same as we saw last night, that the two pillars of contemplative prayers. First, you know that all is one, that God is in everything and everybody. And second, you have to become conscious of that. Like, 
in the book, Shannon talks about how he's marrying this couple. And the woman was a Catholic, but the, the bridegroom was an atheist, didn't believe in God. So William Shannon says, well, you know, God is within you. All you have to do is look in the right place in the right way. In other words, if you, if you did contemplative prayer, you'd know that God was within you. Nothing about being born again, nothing about the gospel, nothing about the cross of Christ or the blood of Christ. It's, you're already connected with God because God is the ground of all that is. So there's no way you cannot be connected to God. So he told this uh, man that if you just looked the, within, you know, if you looked in the right way, you'd find God. Okay, next one. And here's Shannon again. Uh, notice this silence on fire. I believe that's a reference to Kundalini. That in these type of prayers, you have this serpent power that surges up through the spine. And, you know, that doesn't make sense. How can silence be on fire? You know, how's that po- how can silence be on fire? How is that possible? Well, if you see it in terms of the metaphysical realm, if you see it in terms of mysticism, that people that are in the silence experience this fiery power called the kundalini that surges up their spine. And, he, and I can say that with confidence because of the doctrine or the teaching or the spirituality that Shannon expounds. Okay, there is a oneness in God that unites all women and men. The goal of all true spirituality is to achieve an awareness of our oneness with God and with all of God's creation. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is pure Hinduism. That is pure Hinduism. But yet, um, Brennan Manning, uh, in, in an interview, said that that is a book every Christian should have, Silence on Fire. And this is, this is a man who uh, seriously impacted you know, uh, Beth Moore in her spirituality. So you, are you starting to get the picture here that this isn't some fringe, radical type of a... Uh, and Kay Arthur, this isn't some fringe, radical type of a group that exists you know, far in the obscure reaches of Christianity. That this is the main thing you would find in the Roman Catholic Church and the mainline Protestant churches. And now, starting through guys like Foster, it's starting to flow. Now, I don't like to use words like creep. It's flowing into the evangelical church. Okay, next one. How many of you have heard of Sue Monk Kidd? Okay, this is the perfect example of what I'm talking about. Um, to me, this is one of the most important parts of this talk. If this is all I showed you, you know, this would be worth it. You know, this would be worth you coming just to see this uh, section right here. Sue Monk Kidd was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher in a small town in South Carolina. Now, how more conservative can you get? Southern Baptist, small town, South Carolina. And um, she started doing contempt. By the way, uh, uh, how many of you have heard of her books, The Secret Life of Bees? It sold four million copies. Four million copies. Very popular. And her other book was The Mermaid Chair, which is right there. But uh, these books came out of her um, experiences with um, contemplative prayer. Um, her first book, next one, please. This was her first book called God's Joyful Surprise. And uh, this is on how she stumbled into contemplative prayer. Very, this is very important. She was a Sunday school teacher at a Baptist church, and somebody in her Sunday school class gave her a copy of Thomas Merton's book, one of his books. I don't know which one it was, but somebody said, here, you should read Thomas Merton, you know. So this got her into the contemplative prayer movement, and she started reading all these people like uh, Henry Nouwen, and she started doing mantra-type prayer. I mean, it's all in this book. But look who thought this was a good book. Oh, let me, that's right, I have to, this is quotes from the book. She says, I found a host of Christian thinkers and saints talking about a way of being with God, a way of, of needing Him and experiencing Him in the depths of one's being, that opened the door to oneness with him. They called it contemplation. And like I said, contemplation isn't thinking, it's not thinking. I was amazed to realize that I had known practically nothing about this ancient and powerful tradition of Christian meditation. I was ready. I was ready. Okay, now, next one. This is what I... Okay, look who... uh, You remember Virtue Magazine? How many of you remember Virtue Magazine? 
Okay, this was Virtue Magazine's best book of the year. Okay, a joy to read from beginning to end. The message and challenge of the book is profound. Today's Christian woman. Kids suggest some disciplines for cultivating some interior quietness and a richer personal experience of God's love. Moody Monthly. Moody Monthly. So the Christian you know, establishment saw this book as a very good Christian book, right? Right? And I want to show you where contemplative prayer led Sue Monk Kidd. Okay, next one. Okay, a few years, some years later, maybe, oh, maybe 10 years later, eight, somewhere eight, 10 years later, she came out with the dance of the dissident daughter. Again, see, Sue Monk Kidd. And she'd become a new ager. Actually become a new ager. Next one. Okay, this is now who her ultimate authority is. Okay, the minister was preaching. He was holding up a Bible. It was open, perched in, in his hand, raised in his hand, as a blackbird, had, like a blackbird had landed. Uh, he was saying that, th that the Bible was the sole and ultimate authority of the Christian's life, the sole and ultimate authority. I remember a feeling rising up from a place about two inches below my navel. It was passionate, determined feeling and spread from the core of me like a current so that my skin vibrated. Where did it go? So my skin, that my skin vibrated with it. If feelings could be translated in English, this feeling would have been roughly the word no. It was the purest inner knowing I had experienced, and it was shouting at me, no, no, no. The ultimate authority in my life is not the Bible. It is not uh, confined between the covers of a book. It is, not, it is not something written by men and frozen in time. It is not from a source outside myself. The ultimate authority is my divine, the divine voice in my soul, period. <sighs> now, do you all get that? <sighs> so that is where contemplative prayer took Sue Monk Kidd. It was no longer the Bible. It was the divine voice in her soul, period. It, what, what makes us so powerful is she talks about uh, this feeling, spread, passionate feeling spreading out from the core of me like a current so that my skin vibrated with it. Now, that is creepy. You know, that is creepy. I can imagine what's going on there. Okay, next one. Okay, so now she worships the goddess. You know, we also need goddess consciousness to reveal Earth's holiness. Matter becomes inspired. It breathes divinity. Earth becomes alive and sacred. Goddess offers us the holiness of everything. See, she is a New Ager now. She went from a Baptist Sunday school teacher to being a New Ager. As I grounded myself in feminine spiritual experience, that fall I was um, initiated into my body in a deeper way. I came to know myself as an embodiment of goddess. Mystical awakening in all the great religious traditions, including Christianity, involves arriving at an experience of unity or non-dualism. In Zen, it's called samadhi. Transcendence and immanence are not separate. The divine is one. The dancer and all the dances are one. The day of my awakening was the day I saw and knew that I saw all things in God and God in all things. That's what I mean. That, that one section kind of says it all. It speaks for itself. Okay, next one. Okay, this is Brian McLaren. Now we're going to get into the emerging church. See, the emerging church is also based on contemplative prayer. Um, Sue Monk Kidd was no kid. <laughs> Sue Monk Kidd was a mother, a wife and mother. Uh, she had, you know, uh, grown children. You know, she was, she was not somebody who um, was eccentric or offbeat. She was a normal person. And she got into contemplative prayer and started doing it, and everybody, you know, Moody Monthly thought it was great, and she became a new ager as a result of it. So now we have other leaders that are popping up. Brian McLaren has written many books. He's written um, a book called Everything Must Change. He's also written a book called uh, A New Kind of Christian. A New Kind of Christian. Well, what's this new kind of Christian going to be like, you know? Would you like to know? Okay, next one, please. 
Okay, this is a book called Reimagining Christianity by Alan Jones, who's a, a contemplative uh, author. And right here, this is, sums up what the book is about. There we have the cross, and that's a statue of Buddha right there. See, that's Buddha right there. And so we have the cross and Buddha. That's a, like a dashboard, see it? So we have Christianity and Buddhism. And the whole book is about uh, how the world's religions are coming together at the mystical level. You know, all these mystics are merging, and it doesn't matter what, uh, what religion you're in. Like, you know, remember what uh, Thomas Merton said, that that Sufi master was filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, that's what this book is like. Anyhow, Brian McLaren, uh, oh, oh, let me read from this first. I'm kind of, okay. He says, the life of contemplative prayer, loved and in communion with all things, the soul is born in and out of the secret silence of God. This silence is at the heart of mysticism. This, this silence at the heart of mysticism is not only the meeting point of the great traditions, that's the world's religions, but also where all hearts might meet. You know, you don't even have to be in a religion. You can be an atheist. In other words, every, all seven billion, six and a half billion people on the planet can meet, all hearts can meet at the level of the secret silence of God. This silence is at the heart of mysticism. Okay, this, this conference here, the, the connotation of this conference is, you know, that we're heading toward the last days, and the, there's this individual called the Antichrist who's going to rise and unite all the world's religions under his, under his banner and under his tutelage. And I believe that, you know, there's that verse where Paul says, that day, you know, the day of the Lord shall not come except there come a falling away first, and then the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And this is in the context of the mystery of iniquity. And I believe this mystery of iniquity is the occult. How many of you would agree with that? The mystery of iniquity is the occult. I know that may sound kind of radical to some people, but um, this book is on basically the mystery of iniquity, that, uh, that in this, uh, this type of prayer, whether it's Zen or yoga or Reiki or contemplative prayer or Kabbalah, or Sufism, that all these mystical traditions are going to merge with the view that man is divine, that all people are God. You know, remember what Su Mung Kid taught, called a goddess? Well, that's feminine for God. She's now a goddess. So uh, Brian McLaren, head, you know, leader of the emerging church, endorsed the back of this book. Okay, next one, please. He says, it used to be the... <laughs> it used to be... It used to be that Christian institutions and systems of dogma sustained the spiritual life of Christians. So in other words, it used to be that systems of dogma sustained the spiritual life of Christians. Now, now, what does he mean by systems of dogma? Well, he means the gospel. You know, doc, uh, dogma is a Latin word for doctrine. So in other words, he's saying it used to be that doctrine is what sustained the spiritual life of Christians. Increasingly, spirituality itself is what sustains everything else. Alan Jones is a pioneer in reimagining a Christian faith that emerges from authentic spirituality. His work stimulates and encourages me deeply. What he means by authentic spirituality is contemplative prayer, you know, mysticism. So in other words, doctrine is out, mysticism is in. Next one. Hey, this is Tony Jones who's another major writer in the emerging church, very popular, and he says the following. Okay, next one. The basic method, okay, the, there was a, a um, I guess you'd call it a treatise that came out in the 1300s called The Cloud of Unknowing, and it was written anonymously, and it was based on the teachings of the Desert Fathers, and it says that you have to take a little word and strike down all other words with it, like using a mantra. You take a little word and strike down all other words, your thoughts, you know, using this. And that's what he means by the cloud. The basic method promoted in the cloud is to move beyond thinking into a place of utter stillness with the Lord. The believer first must achieve a state of silence and contemplation, and then God works in the believer's heart. So again, you know, the emerging church is saying that God can only work in your heart if you go into the silence. But I believe that's not true. Remember the analogy earlier about parents and children? You know, children do not need a method or technique to get their parents' guidance or attention or direction. So this should be, you know, people should see this is untrue right off the bat just based on their experience as parents. 
You know, you don't have to use some esoteric method to get God's guidance or direction. Am I right? Yes. And secondly, I mean, this doesn't come from the Bible. This comes from the Desert Fathers. But some, it's weird. People don't, they don't see that. They, it doesn't register. It's like, you know, is this in the Bible? Is, is this found in Scripture? You know what they do? They, they turn to uh, um, the Psalms. There's this verse in the Psalms that says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. And, I mean, that's the one they all use. And, they, you know, when I talk, they say, well, doesn't the Bible say to be still and know that I am God? You know, doesn't it say to be still? Well, what it means by be still is, if you look at the context, Israel is being threatened and there's, like, danger ahead. And God says, be still and know that I In other words, calm down and relax. It's not empty your mind. It's not going to altered states of consciousness. It's just, you know... Be still, like, you know, your kids, you've, you know, they're running around, oh, Johnny's going to beat me up. And, oh, just be still and know that, you know, I'm your parent and nothing's going to happen to you. You know, just be still. In other words, just calm down and relax. But they use it to mean empty your mind, to go into the silence. Okay, next one. Okay, this was um, in Christianity Today. It says, in a feature article in Christianity Today titled, The Emerging Mis- Emergent Mystique, Brian McLaren, who is the man referred to as a de facto leader of this movement, named Richard Foster as one of the key mentors for the emerging church. So the emerging church is based on this view that Christianity isn't complete without mysticism. You know? And like I said earlier, that um, Rick Warren, in his book, uh, The Purpose Driven Church, I can't remember what page it's on, but it's easy to find, says that the ch- Richard Fo- God has raised up Richard Foster to bring the church to full maturity. So in other words, when we, everybody's a mystic, then the church will be mature because everybody will, will know God. Everybody will have this guidance and direction then because, you know, they're doing c- contemplative prayer. But what's really going to happen is they're going to wind up like Sue Monk Kid. You know, they're going to wind up like Sue Monk Kid. Next one. Um, see, I talked to um, Foster back in 1994, and he told me personally, like, this is the guy that, uh, is con- that fa- um, Rick Warren sees as being um, the one who's going to bring the church to full maturity, and he's also the de facto leader of the emerging church. So we got like this whole gamut of evangelical Christianity covered now. And I talked to him in um, 1994, and he told me personally that Thomas Merton tried to awaken God's people. See, Thomas Merton there. And that's the same Thomas Merton who prays the Sufi, uh, you know, the Sufi sheikh here is uh, um, that they spoke, how did he put it here? Let me read that again. Now that you've seen this. With Sheikh Ahmad, I speak the same language. So Thomas Merton spoke the same language as Sheikh Ahmad, and Richard Foster speaks the same language as Thomas Merton. Okay, next one, please. Hey, Leonard Sweet. Um, Leonard Sweet and Rick Warren put out a, uh, a, uh, um, a video together back in the 90s. And Rick, er, Leonard Sweet uh, recently spoke at uh, Saddleback Church. And Leonard Sweet is also considered one of the major figures in the, um, the emerging church. Okay, next one. And he says, mysticism once cast to the sidelines of the Christian tradition. And by sidelines, he means like monks and nuns, you know, just a small percentage of the population, is now situated in postmodern culture near the center. In the words of one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, Jesuit philosopher Karl Rayner, the Christian of tomorrow will be a mystic, one who has experienced something, or he will be nothing. So in other words, the Christian of the future will either be you know, someone who does contemplative prayer, or they won't be a Christian. They won't, and I get the impression they won't allow to be a Christian because they'll be too unpopular. You'll be seen as like a, you know, a extraordinarily negative type individual who, who will ruin everything. If you, if you go around telling people this is of the devil, are they going to let you stick around? They're going to tell you to hit the road. I mean, that makes sense, Right. If the, if the Christian of tomorrow is a mystic. This guy was speaking at Saddleback Church just, you know, weeks ago. Mysticism is metaphysics arrived at through mind-body experience. That's meditation. 
that mind-body thing is meditation. Mysticism begins in experience, it ends in theology, and that's true. But this theology is New Age theology, as we saw with Sue Monk Kidd. Next one. Okay, Mike Pershawn is also uh, Youth Specialties. Uh, how many of you know what Youth Specialties is? That is the main supplier of youth ministries in the United States. And um, this, this person, Mike Pershawn, got to take another drink of water. I get impassioned, and so my mouth gets all, or throat gets all dry. But at least I'm not coughing. Thank the Lord for that. Thank the Lord for that. Okay, Mike Pershawn writing for you special. In fact, every church in the country is connected with you specialties. And he says, I started using the phrase listening prayer when I talked about my own experiences in meditation. I built myself a prayer room, a tiny sanctuary in a basement closet filled with books on spiritual disciplines, contemplative prayer, and Christian mysticism. In that space, I lit candles, burned incense, hung rosaries, and listened to tapes of Benedictine monks. I meditated for hours on words, images, and sounds. I reached the point of being able to achieve alpha brainwave patterns. Okay, alpha is what uh, Zen Buddhist monks experience in meditation. In fact, how many of you have heard of Silva mind control? Okay, that's what they call their meditation. They call it the alpha state and Silva mind control. They refer to it as alpha. Okay, I reached the point of being able to achieve alpha brain patterns the state in which dreams occur while still awake and meditating. So, in other words, he's dreaming while he's not sleeping. Well, to me, that's not dreams. That's, you know, mystical experience. To me, that's the, the type of occult things that we talked about last night. You know, in other words, you're not asleep, but you're having dreamlike um, occurrences. You're having dreamlike experiences. And I believe he was going into the demonic realm. Um, next one. That's why Jesus says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. And vain repetitions, you know, that's what a mantra is. Every mystical system in the heathen world at that time used mantras to get in touch with God. Okay, now he warned about it. Jesus warned about it. Because even though you pick a, a, a word that has religious connotations, if you say it over and over and over again, it becomes vain. Like I said, you know, I am here. If you say it once or even twice, you know, it may make sense. But if you say it for 20 minutes, it becomes vain, you know, empty. That's the word vain means is empty. Next one, please. Okay, prayer is a personal relationship with God. You know, that's what I've been talking about the whole, the whole uh, hour here or so is, is that... Um, it's like a parent-child, you know, a parent-child relationship. You know, I mean, it's intimate. It's, it's connected. You know, you talk to God. You know, God, I believe God uh, interacts with you. You know, it's, it's natural. It's normal. Uh, Jesus said, I will send you uh, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he will abide with you forever. And also it says that the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth, right? Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He didn't say uh, the silence will guide you into all truth, did he? You know, Jesus never said anything about emptying the mind or going to the silence. And you know, he went off into um, silent places to pray. He went off into the desert to pray, but nowhere did you know, the Apostle Paul said, uh, "You know, I did not uh, fail to declare unto you the whole counsel of God." Remember that? I think it's in Thessalonians. In other words, everything God wanted you to know, He told you, right? Everything he wanted you to know, he told you. Well, there's nothing that Paul ever mentioned about, you know, uh, repeating sacred words and going into the silence. That Christianity is like a natural, natural relationship with God. Once you're born again, once you're saved, once you're in, the, in you know, the body of Christ, there's just this, you know, normal, react, or normal uh, relationship you have with God. There's no such thing as an esoteric practice that has been missing that is now being discovered and once you have it, then you get God's full guidance and direction. Brennan Manning, I didn't have that up there. He said, only in the silence can the voice of love be heard. Only in the silence, you know. And he didn't say God. He said the voice of love. Well, well what is the voice of love, you know? 
the voice of love. Henry Nouwen also uses the term, the voice of love. Okay, next one. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, we should walk in them. So, you know, if we're God's workmanship, see, when I heard Foster talk, he said we're, we're uh, he, paints, he painted this bleak uh, picture of Christianity. He says we're, uh, we've become barren within, that we're floundering. You know, the church is floundering. Um, we're trying rather than training. We're trying rather than training. So he paints this bleak picture that the church is just getting nowhere and we become barren within. Well, what does that mean, we become barren within? How can Christians become barren within? You know, how is that possible? Well, we haven't become barren within. How many of you feel like you're barren within? Nobody, right? Well, he said that we become barren within and we're trying rather than training. And by training, he means being trained in the contemplative tradition. And uh, I think he would, you know, I'm not misrepresenting him. He, um, he says that Christianity is not complete without the contemplative tradition, which comes from the Desert Fathers. You know, we've been looking at it here. Well, when you look at uh, some of the people, like, you know, Sue Mung Kidd, and there's many others, you know, Merton now and Sue Mung, I, I could spend a whole day showing you similar, uh, you know, similar stories of, of, um, of people that uh, went the same route. So uh, I'm not just picking out one, you know, it's not like Sue Mung Kid's the only one, and I just think, oh, here's one, you know, I'll, I'll uh, get these people all worked up with just this one little person here. No, I've studied this for many years, and she, Sue Mung Kid is, is normal. I mean, she's typical of people that go this route. Okay, next one. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship or adoption. And by him we cry, Abba, or Father. So again, you know, I, I want to drive home the point that you do not, not only do you not need contemplative prayer, but you, it's dangerous. You know, it's dangerous, and it's becoming widely promoted. You know, a lot of people, you go into a Christian bookstore, and there's many books on contemplative prayer. Uh, how many of you have heard of a book called Sacred Pathways? Gary Thomas. How many of you have heard of Gary Thomas? Now, he is closely associated with... Um, James Dobson. James Dobson, he's on his radio show, and James Dobson uh, has him in his, uh, what's, that guy, what's that book called, the James the, the Magazine? And Gary Thomas is um, a practitioner of contemplative prayer and says that you, you pick a word and you say it for 20 minutes and that this, this will propel you into the presence of God. And this is from his book, Sacred Pathways. Sacred Pathways, and this... Um, he has a whole chapter on contemplative prayer, and like I said, he's very closely connected with James Dobson. So, you know, to me that's alarming. To me that's very alarming. So you got Beth Moore, you got um, uh, James Dobson, you got all these people that, uh, uh, you know, are seeing contemplative prayer as a way to go. But, you know, for, based on Thomas Merton, you know, I, I believe if anybody does contemplative prayer, somewhere in the future they're going to wind up like Thomas Merton. And remember, Foster said that Thomas Merton tried to awaken God's people. Well, he tried to, Thomas Merton tried to lead people into a universal, one world mystical religion in which all are divine. Thomas Merton said that if we all knew who we really were, we'd fall down and worship each other. <laughs> because at the core of every person is the pure glory of God, untouched by sin and illusion untouched by sin and illusion. Now, is that true? Did Thomas Merton try to awaken God's people? No. I believe that's the last one, is it? Yeah, it is. Anyhow, thank you. Well, that was, that was a quick ending for that. Thank you. Great job. Great job. <laughs> um, don't think this is uh, not touching Calvary Chapel. 700 and something Calvary Chapels. One of the leaders of Calvary Chapel recently wrote an article, which you can get, you can go to the um, Lighthouse Trails research online and uh, lighthousetrails.com 
and you will find an article there about the Desert Fathers done by a Calvary Chapel leader. I'm not going to tell you his name because he'll probably sue me, but um, uh, the, um, in the article he talks about that um, this, is, this, is, this is Calvary Chapel. He says, we've got to learn to be silent. We've we got to learn about silence. And he says that um, the Desert Fathers taught us about silence. And one of the great examples of this is uh, a desert father discovered this great revelation. I mean, he must have spent a lot of time with this one, uh, that he was sitting in a steam bath, and he realized if you left the door open, the steam got out. <laughs> but that one, that, that converted me right away, you know. <laughs> and then um, this great desert father said that um, the steam got out, and so this pastor of Calvary Chapel said, one of the Calvary Chapels, the lodge one, said that he felt like um, that if we opened our mouth, the, the, the knowledge of God would come out. Even though we were talking about God, if we spoke about God too much, it would be like steam escaping, and the cognizance of God escapes from the soul. And can you believe that? He likes, in his church, he likes candles all over, and he likes to have communion with the candles to set the mood. And this doesn't matter about burning a candle, for, you know, if you, especially if it has an odor to it, keep your house smelling better, and, but it's nothing matter with a candle. But when you start to put that this candle that makes it spiritual in the place or something like that, you're in deep trouble. You've left off what Jesus told us to do. Ne ne never did Jesus tell us to light a candle. Never. And we, we are the light of the world. Amen. Um, another, another guy... At Biola, there's two university, there's Biola University over in La Mirada, California. There's two leaders over there that teach there. Um, one of them, I won't tell you his name. But um, he teaches that you should stand before, go to a monastery and stand before a statue of Jesus and s repeat his name 300 times. I, I don't know if you have, if you lost track someplace, you'd be in real trouble. You know, you know, is that 292? Or was that, did I say 292? Um, but maybe you get... Uh, Oh, I thought you could do. You could get prayer beads, and you could uh, a rope would tie knots in three hundred knots, and um, you know then you say that three hundred times, and you reach a thin zone, and that's where the spirits will be able to channel to you better. This is taught at a Christian university, well known. It, they, they, you know, Biola said it's no longer a fundamentalist university. It's going to a new level. Um, the Bible says that in the days of Noah, people's imaginations were vain and empty. When Israel fell, days of Lot, now, when Israel was falling in the days of Lot, we, Jesus said it would be like it was in the days of Lot. Well, the book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 16, I think Jeremiah 20 or 22, say that we, they would compare the lifestyle of the people of Israel before they were taken into captivity by Babylon, which is very significant. It's mentioned in chapter 1 verse 17 of Matthew, that there was 14 generations until the carrying away into Babylon from David, very significant to God. Um, well, that before they were carried away, these, both of these men said, Ezekiel and Jeremiah, contemporary prophets, said their lifestyle is to be likened to the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah, the days of Lot. So if you read Jeremiah and you read Ezekiel, and you think, what's this all about? It's the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah, and if you see it today, not one in God in their schools, not one dig underneath and the guys are worshiping you know, demons under the temple and they were secretly worshiping crawling things and all demonic things going on, spirits, devils. Um, that's vain imagination. All, Jeremiah speaks of the vain imagination. Noah's day, vain imagination. And certainly these things are leading us to vain imaginations. You think about, don't think. And I just thought when that man was talking about dreaming, it's daydreaming. If you're not asleep and you're not... <laughs> You're not dreaming, but you are dreaming. It's daydreaming, and then that's a figment of your imagination, daydreaming. So you, can, you could conjure up some real good figments. Now, these people tell us that, um, that God, um, there's a, there's one of them, these great guys tell you about God sleeping. One of the great Calvary Chapel leaders, one of the largest Calvary Chapels, wrote a book on page 40. Chuck Smith took the book and read it to me. What do you think of that? So I try not to. But in that book, he said that um, the greatest person, the greatest man of the hour is this guy in California who has this, uh, who has this great ministry and his peace plan, and that um, he's dreaming God's dream. 
And the book was about dreaming and dreaming. The guy that wrote that book um, about uh, the prayer of Jabez, you know, which never mentioned God. Remember that one? Um, I, I, I know when I read the New Testament, they said to Jesus, uh, teach us to pray. You know, in, 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 Ma- in uh, Luke and in, in Luke chapter 10, teach us to pray. The seven, he said, let you talk to 12 and you know, Matthew 5. He says, well, I do the prayer of Jabez. That works for me. Try that. Did Jesus say that? <laughs> no. He said, pray in this manner. And he repeated, don't pray in vain repetition. So there was a prayer of Jabez went around. But that guy got rich off that book. I mean, he got very wealthy. Never mentioned God, but he got wealthy. And so he wrote another book. And that book was called Dreams or something. And how God's, God, we're part of God's dream. But you know, the scripture says that the God who watches over Israel never slumbers or never sleeps. So that means that God's daydreaming. And you're just a figment of his imagination. <laughs> you're in deep trouble here. <laughs> I hope he isn't vain in his imagination. Well, some of us might think I am, but that's all right. Be careful. This is really coming in the Christian. It's in Calvary Chapel right now. We're fighting against the fight. You know what? When these books, when these books get in there, when this book gets into Calvary Chapel's book system, it's a complete contradiction to the, some of the leaders believe and their books are in there. The Dreamology and, and books about, oh, shouldn't have mentioned that one because I'll get sued for that. It's a big thing about suing everybody going around. So um, you, gotta be, you, gotta be, you have to be careful about everything you say. They want to sue you. So um, this stuff is real, and uh, it's really happening, and it's happening in Calvary. It's hap- so it's happening in us, and we're the good guys. We're supposed to be Bible-believing Christians, and we're, we're verse by verse, and we're off a wacko edge, some of us. They think I am, by the way. So I think they are. Um, but, you know, it's happening in other places that aren't even teaching the Bible. If we're teaching the Bible, we have something to stop it, the Word of God. What about the places that don't even open their Bible or bring their Bibles to church? How are they doing? How about the people who aren't reading the Bible in the daily reading? How about people who don't have any devotional time with God through his word? Where do they stand in this whole thing? They'll stand deceived. And they're willingly being deceived because they're not devoting themselves to God. Peter asked a great question. If these things be true, what manner of people should we be in our devotion to God and our manner of life? What should we be like? So, Father, we pray as we take a break, just give us uh, some excitement in our hearts, Lord, as Jim comes to teach us about simplicity. In Jesus' name. About this time, 